Time for questions, and good to see the house lights are up. If you could say who you are and where you're from. Our first question is right in the centre. Uh, Mick here, Executive Director, Australian Farm Institute. My, my question is to all three speakers. In looking at uh, improving or enhancing the competitiveness or the value of Australian agricultural exports, one of the questions that's asked is whether national reputation, national brand, actually adds some value. So in other words, uh, in the Netherlands, in the US, or Alan, from your perspective globally, do you think there's merit and value in having um, a national effort at promoting uh, credence characteristics or, or environmental characteristics or um, th those intrinsic quality characteristics of products from a, a nation like Australia as part of positioning in some of those emerging markets and differentiating from some of the competition that obviously uh, can win on price but perhaps on not on those other characteristics. Thank you, Mick. Perhaps, Alan, uh, would you like to start? I'm, I'm tempted to say no. I have been involved with some programs years ago. The government funded a program to promote Australian food in Taiwan, and it was a marketing exercise. And I still remember the advertising man that was brought into it when he did the promotion to the agriculture department uh, had a song based on due to Watlands, I love a sunburned country. And I said to him, why do you think that would make any difference in Taiwan? And he said, it doesn't, but he said the clients love it. <laughs> but the reality was that it was very difficult to conceive of a way in which you could actually brand the product. The short, the big, yes, definitely, um, we should um, let everybody know about our health standards, our quarantine standards, not necessarily using them as trade barriers, but the level of safety in our food, which is very high. Uh, but I think then to turn around and suggest to some do that we have a brand. I know that's talked about in some of the sectors. If some talk about do we have a brand for wheat? I think no, but uh, certainly the products have to be marketed in ways which, which meet the consumer. So in broad, yes, it's, it's a big asset, but I think we need to be careful not to assume that um, putting a brand on wheat saying it's Australia will actually mean it'll mean anything to the consumers if it's a bold product. Greg, what do you think? It, I, the only thing I can think of is, uh, as an example was when we, this is 30 some years ago, uh, Australian wines, US wines, breaking into markets. Now there was a case where there was the dominance of, of European old world wines. And I think it did make a difference, not necessarily that it was actively marketed by the government, but it was once the case was made that these had good quality and good value, uh, that shine stayed on a lot of products that I think had to mature and grow from that point forward. But it was certainly, uh, it's something in the United States that seemed to work, even though clearly it was a brand by brand type of activity. Uh, I think there is some merit uh, if you look at it carefully and it really does follow from identifying with market characteristics that the consumers are looking for. And Giles? Yeah, I think uh, my answer would be, uh, yes, there is value, but you need to create that value on the, um, uh, ultimately, what is then the differentiating factor of Australia? And I think, uh, like Alan said, it, it is probably to do with uh, food safety, um, referring to uh, the origin as being part of something that is sometimes in short supply in, in Asia, which is indeed that food safety issue. Mm -hmm. And if you can create that, it should happen, uh, it should help you in your exports. There is a downside to it, which is that if you, if you fail to deliver, um, you could also harm yourself. So you need to get your controls uh, up to a reasonable high standard to see that you actually deliver the, the value that you propose to your customer. Our next question is up the top on my left. Hi, uh, Bruce, this is on. Bruce Muirhead from uh, the University of Waterloo in Canada. And I have a question for Mr. Oxley where you mentioned that 15% of Australian farmland has been taken out of production over the last 12 years and you mentioned a number of reasons why. And I wonder if um, you have a comment on the fact that it's roughly coincident with the time Australia launched itself on its complete deregulation program with no support to farmers at all, if that has any impact in, uh, in terms of the decline in farmland. I've read a lot on, in the Australian, say, and listened to ABC as well about um, the difficulties, I guess, that farmers experience in today's Australia as well. 
Thanks. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I don't know how you'd measure the, there has been some reduction of support, but by the same token, there's still quite a lot of support for farming generated by, uh, by government and so on. So uh, that may have been a factor. Um, although when I think back, we government spent, I think, a billion dollars restructuring the dairy industry about a decade ago. So I don't know if your assertion that there's been a drop of support um, actually stands. In short, I think my answer is I think not. Uh, the uh, hasn't actually affected some of the larger producers, and uh, I'm actually some work needs to be done as to what explains this reduction. And what I put up there were suggestions. So there were, I think we need some serious research to actually identify what has driven it. Mm. Question in the centre. Uh, Eric Yusheng from Avers. I have uh, two questions actually for Greg. Uh, uh, the first one is that you mentioned that ERS has recently adjusted down the projection of a media, uh, media term uh, food demand from developing countries from the whole uh, world. Actually, in addition to what you mentioned about that increasing production capacity, is there any other concern which contribute to this I mean, adjust down uh, from the demand perspective? The second question is that related to, I mean, what you mentioned about the structural change in agriculture uh, industry in U.S. in particular, that uh, I mean, large farm becoming more dominant in the sector. Now, we in Australia, we observe the similar phenomena. However, yesterday, when Peter making his uh, presentation, talking about in terms of number of farms, we found actually the polarization effect, which is, I mean, larger farms number becomes more and more uh, become larger and larger, while smallest farms actually, the, in terms of number, has been increasing. Well, in the middle, in the medium sized farm, actually decreasing. I would like to have your comments on whether the similar phenomena has also been observed in the US. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'll take the second one first, and the answer is yes. Uh, the middle has been squeezed. Uh, we've seen it in dairy, we've seen it on just about every type of, of farming or in every type of farming in the United States. It's, and it's primarily the case, uh, and our data support it, and I think we've we heard about it as well for Australia, off-farm income is what keeps some of these farmers, the smaller farmers, on that space. And so the larger farms, you still have some off-farm income, certainly for issues like insurance and so forth. It's nice to have somebody in manufacturing where they can get that insurance for the family. But, the, the driving force has been this consolidation for uh, those, those areas where there has been technological gain from scale. Uh, the second part, or the first question, on this issue of, um, let me go back to the, about looking at what's kind of drawn away from, uh, or concerns about the demand, uh, macroeconomic growth is certainly one of those first characteristics that jumps out. Any country that's in transition, which would be any country that's developing in particular, uh, it's got to find that next stone in the stream to get to as it progresses. And to the extent that that's difficult, to the extent that that is, there's a, a, a hitch in, in that uh, planning, uh, and certainly we've seen that any time, we, well, certainly on the centrally planned economies, where it stands out very much so in terms of government policy, uh, where there's a misstep, we see that those, that oftentimes there is some withdrawal or some, some uh, slowing down of the economy, and that in turn plays out in terms of demand down the road. Uh, you know, I can, I can look at uh, a number of factors, but I would say that, that macroeconomic growth and, and certainly growth in those economies is the, is, would be my main concern about changing those projections. Okay. Next question. Uh, Holger Meinke, University of Tasmania, as well as Wageningen University. So my question is to Gilles about uh, the, the comparison between our two systems. Uh, you mentioned Wageningen several times in your talk. I'm wondering if you could reflect on the importance of the private-public partnerships and how the private sector actually interacts with its university in the Netherlands and what Australia might be able to learn from it. Yeah, I think the <coughs> Wageningen University, uh, on, on one hand, it's indeed the university that is a uh, strong educational hub for, uh, for the higher end uh, side, but it is also involved in the various um, research groups that um, 
do both um, research for uh, in the public domain, um, but also in private as, as private uh, enterprises, or at least with private um, contractors. And it's it's been a part where they've been clustering uh, a lot of the uh, food companies around their university to also see that um, even up to, uh, um, well not even, but there's uh, Chinese dairy companies that want to set up a research space in Wageningen to see to it that they are close to a global center of research. So actually what you do, you have on one hand, you have your university, but you attract by clustering food companies and their their own uh, research, you actually cluster a, a bigger group and that actually creates a, uh, a bigger effort and a bigger, um, what, what would, you, would you say, a bigger, um, uh, well, a bigger, uh, ent well, a bigger combination of all efforts. And that, that, le that, is, that is very helpful. Thank you, Giles. Alan, uh, at the end of your presentation, you, you left me hanging there a little bit. I was, I was keen to hear a little bit more. You were talking about the reduction in the national farmland estate. Um, the policy changes there have, some have been subtle, some have been more significant, but they've been sustained over a period of time. Do, um, do you think that um, most of us realise how significant some of those changes are and what potentially they mean going forward? Um. There's a dimension here which uh, I, I think uh, is characteristic and to a large degree I think this is a consequence of uh, the impact in public thinking of environment policy. Mm. And uh, what uh, I think what's happened is that uh, environmental groups have argued for excision of land for various purposes. It's one of the most common positions that they take. And what on both sides of politics in this country uh, has failed to happen is to actually articulate exactly what that conservation objective is. And simply it's been now generally asserted that you, it, it's a very good idea to just conserve more land without actually thinking about which particular species, which landscape uh, are you dealing with. It's interesting that one of the areas where, um, I left out one of those factors actually, which is forestry. Um, we've really uh, ruined our forest industry in Australia by not pursuing what were extremely rational environmental policies developed way back in the 80s, where government and industry and environmentals came together. The entire forest estate was assessed. The uh, environmental areas were identified. The biomes were detected, were, were identified, and the whole country is mapped out as saying we will preserve these types of species and growth areas in these areas with this amount. We'll then look at what land is after that. The land that was used for sustainable forestry is marked out, and then the land for conservation was marked out. It was world's best practice. Mm. From the moment that was implemented, the environmental groups just maintained a campaign to continue to shrink the farmland. And they, for example, in Victoria, the land which had been identified for sustainable forestry uh, in the end was reduced by half. Now, to a degree, what's happened, I, the, the fault for this lies on the other side of the public policy fence where I think governments haven't actually sat down and articulated well enough what to do. And I, I think there's, it, with the, with the farm estate, yeah. I think there's a, there's a fairly clear strategy that could be applied, but all it's actually basically is all occurred by incrementalism. And I think um, inadequate consideration of environmental issues in the public policy by the mainstream parties. Thank you, Alan. I'll draw a close there. I, I note that the Minister has just joined us. We will take a very brief break, less than two minutes just to do some seat changing. But our panel this morning has been Alan Oxley, Greg Pompelli and Giles Balmeister. Could you please thank them?